In the early 1930s, the people of Swansea and Gower were able to experience flights when, on the 28th of August 1932, a National Aviation Day display was held in a large field off Fenaway Lane, adjacent to Pennard Church. Sir Alan Cobham brought his flying circus, giving pleasure flights and aerobatic displays. Further displays were held in the field in 1935, the Jubilee Air display on the 8th of June, and the National Aviation Day display on the 26th of September, which was spoilt by low cloud and rain. The idea behind these events were for people to become more air-minded. On the 5th and 6th of June 1933, a display by the rival organisation known as the British Hospitals Air Pageant visited Park Le Breos, close to Plain Mine, bringing with them a number of aircraft, including a de Havilland Dragon. Alan Richards remembers the pageant. I first flew an aircraft at Park Le Breos in 1933. The British Hospitals Air Circus, I think it was, um, I think it was a predecessor to Alan Cobham, and a number of different types. Um, uh, we flew, oddly enough, my father uh, uh, agreed to pay for, not only pay for the flight, pay for the best flight, and he came uh, with us. Uh, it was air crews over Swansea. Um, was sort of a, a number of aircraft, Fox Moth, I recall, Tiger Moth, obviously, the, the great uh, Edward Jones with his tiger moth, um, uh, with, yeah, with his tiger, uh, and uh, various light, uh, I think it was a puss moth as well. Uh, there was certainly a 504, and there was this uh, formation flight over Swansea. But I was rather disappointed because uh, airmen were supposed to wear leather helmets, would they, and had goggles on their forehead. I, I don't, never knew why they had to go on their forehead because, um, you know, motorcyclists had them over their eyes, but airmen, when you ever saw an airman, he had his on his forehead, it took a lot of working out. Anyhow, I got into this aircraft and it was like a little sloping tram car. And the pilot had a straw hat on. I mean, it was appalling. A pilot in, in a, in a some blazer. And I mean, he can't have been a proper pilot, you see. Uh, anyhow, it was it was rather a rather nice trip, and it certainly certainly hooked me on flying. May 1937 saw the first flight from Fairwood Common, when a young John Heyman flew a hand-built zoggling single-seat glider built by Harry Knott. The glider was known as Cloudhawk, and it was launched off a small hill on Fairwood Common. We brought the plane out, used to bring the plane out to Fairwood every Sunday. Harry Knott was supposed to be pilot. Time after time, he was sitting along the ground, never got off. And then the boys thought, Harry gave up. The boys thought, well, we'll have a ride in it. So they took it into a little ride on the ground. And Aubrey Williams said to me, John, you've you partly built this machine. Why don't you have a little ride? And I thought of a way to get it off the ground. And uh, stretched the ropes out, he let go. I put a step back and up I went. But I haven't thought then how to get it back down, so I crashed. A fortnight later we rebuilt it, took it back up to Fowler, I took it up and I brought it down. Easy as that. The, the rumour went around that there was going to be flying on the Fairwood Common, you see, and uh, we all got on our bicycles and went up there. And there was uh, uh, two guys that I subsequently knew to be Harry Knott and John Heyman. And John Heyman was the intrepid pilot, and he got uh, yards and yards and yards of heavy bungee elastic. And uh, the, the idea was there were a couple of guys sat on the ground grasping the, the rudder, and uh, I don't know, half a dozen or a dozen maybe uh, lads and bears hangers on, uh, sort of rushed forward with this uh, this bungee rubber and at a certain point the, the guys who were sitting on the ground digging the heels in, they let go of the tail and you sort of uh, uh, escaped as quickly as you could when this glider did this sort of ground slide. It was able to get off the ground but mainly because uh, it was on sloping ground, it elevated, uh, slightly elevated uh, ground where it was launched. But uh, it, it, was, it was a genuine flight, but uh, there wasn't too much gain of height. During the summer break of 1942, members of the University Air Squadron attended summer camp at the airfield. 
Alan Richards remembers his first visit to RAF Fairwood Common and his meeting with Wing Commander Richard Atchley, who devised the DREM landing system to aid landings in poor visibility. As a member of the Swansea University Air Squadron, we were attached, as it were, to, to Fairwood Common. And uh, we used to visit there, sort of a day visit, and then in, at Easter and at the summer of 42, we did a summer camp there. Um, my first impressions were the, <laughs> with talking to various airmen, they sort of looked at us up and down, asked who we were, and we said we hoped to join the Air Force, and the, you know, the general opinion was, don't! Um, it was an impression of, uh, of chaos, you know, people running to and fro, and of course we got no idea why they were running to and fro, and the, these immense queues for everything queues for the uh, cookhouse, queues for the lavatory, uh, queues for everything, and uh, frankly it could have put one off a bit. But of course, you know, flying, magic. And we did have the opportunity to fly in a, a Moth Miner, which was a marvellous aircraft. Um, very, very impressive thing. As far as I recall, it didn't have flaps as we, as we know them. It had this sort of enormous perforated board underneath it, but anyway, uh, it, it really was an experience. Uh, we were flow, there, was, there was no sort of instructor as such, but there were bow fighters there at the time, and any sort of spare bow fighter pilot who fancies his chances uh, took us up on a, well, officially air experience flight, but uh, the, the fellow, rather foolishly, uh, allowed me to take off, and uh, I'll never forget that. Ease the throttle slowly forward, keeping straight with the rudder. And it very well went down uh, the Gower Coast, totally uh, unknown view, you know, from the seaward, looking inward. And uh, he did a thing that a lot of the boys I suddenly discovered did at Fairwood, was with a, a strong wind from the sea to approach the cliff top very slightly below cliff top level, relying on the, the updraft to uh, to carry you over. Uh, there were s some of them were fairly laid back fellows. During summer camp at uh, at Fairwood Common, we saw quite a lot of. Uh, I think then it was Sir Richard. At oh, he wasn't Sir then. Richard actually, who was wing commander at the time. Of course, he was succeeded by uh, David actually, his uh, twin and indistinguishable brother. And uh, he used to take a lot of interest in us lads. And I, I remember he asked me, why did I want to become a pilot in the Air Force? Well, I didn't like to tell him the truth, which was why I, I thought everybody wanted to be a pilot. And joining the Air Force was the only way I could do it and nothing. Uh, so I said the usual sort of things and uh, this sort of thing. And he looked at me very hard and he said, the only chance you've got of sitting in the pilot seat of a Royal Air Force aircraft is that it, you are the best man we can find to be there, and that's something that been with me all my life. Um, there was a father, uh, rather amusing answer. Another question uh, one of my colleagues asked was, why can't we have tricycle undercarriages uh, like some of the American aircraft are, are having now? and actually rounded on him and said, whatever should we want tricycle the carriages for? And he said, well, they, they, they're easy to land. The Americans might require them, but a pilot in the Royal Air Force is so adept at every sort of manoeuvre that landing a tailwheel aircraft presents no problems whatsoever. Well, in relation to the DREM lighting system, it was installed at Fairwood Common. There weren't many installations. It was rather expensive, and of course it was rather attractive to uh, intruder aircraft, so it tended to be uh, not used in the uh, south and east of, of England, and was largely confined to night fighter stations. It consisted of uh, a circle of lights, I think poles 10 or 12 feet high, with what were probably were looked like the, the sunken runway lights uh, were stuck on the top of a pole and they formed this circuit about, I think about four miles diameter around uh, an airfield. 
uh, so that uh, you you looking for the particular if you remember there was no radar uh, direction finding was very hit or miss even the radio I mean 1940 the Battle of Britain there was single channel radios you see and, and it was only really 42 the four the eight channel radio came in and if you were away from your base you, do, you didn't have the crystals in your set for this particular place you're looking for so you, you flew and you found these lights which gave you a much bigger target than just a flare path and you immediately turned right and followed the lights around kept the lights on your left and followed round in a in a left hand circuit until you found a digraph which in the case of Fairwood Common was FC and that was sighted uh, above Ilston behind Park Mill there and uh, you, you continued on and where the reached the approach the active runway there was a branch off rather like the the cat's eyes go off at a motorway exit you exited down this one that took you in, in, into the, right to the funnel and uh, to the threshold. I never used Fairwood Common at Drem. Uh, I used it actually later, some year later, at uh, Cologne, by which time they'd got uh, neon lights, uh, sodium lights, and of course absolutely great in fog. And I had to fly into Cologne with no radio communication with them in very bad visibility and of course it was absolutely magic you just sort of flew in the general direction and when you you saw uh, a sodium light you turned right you saw another one great you're there and you you, you just fly around you see the digraph uh, cl and uh, uh, follow the lead in marvelous system i do recall when we were at summer camp uh, there was no night flying, everything was very still and quiet, and we were woken by um, an aircraft, a single engine aircraft, it was a hurricane, uh, taking off. And it was uh, one of the Atchley brothers. Apparently, they had some kind of telepathic communication, or allegedly so. And the, the, the other brother, who's now in the south of England, uh, apparently it had some kind of mishap. And he in the night became aware of that and got out the duty crew and got out his his black hurricane and went down to the south coast to see what trouble was with his, with his brother quite a remarkable thing alan richards became a sergeant pilot in the royal air force flying master tugs towing hotspur gliders which were used to train glider pilots on the run-up to the allied assaults in northwest europe in 1944. Interestingly, David Atchley succeeded his twin brother Richard as station commanding officer in April 1942. The photograph shows Group Captain David Atchley with officers and committee members of 215 Squadron Air Training Corps, including the Swansea Squadron's commanding officer, Sir Arthur Whitton-Brown. <laughs>